hot, steamy air lingered between the drab stone walls as I entered the room. Naked men everywhere. Okay, I can do this. Up next on the Crossing Ideas Podcast. Lucky enough to win some awards, author of 13 novels, including Lady Trio and the Demon Warrior of Hanoi, contemporary fantasy set to excite the senses. Watch for it this fall on paperback or ebook, wherever you buy books. You can check out all my works at mwsassy.com. That is www.mwsassy.com. I'm excited to kick off season two of my podcast. Honestly, Season one was a blast, reliving so many experiences in Vietnam and what they taught me about today's world. If you haven't listened yet to season one, all 12 episodes are free to stream right now, so please check them out. When on Spotify, there's a place to support the podcast if you'd like to do so. I thank everyone for the comments and listens on season one. Now we come to season two, which I've entitled Cities and Historical Sites. My goal of this podcast is to use my vast experience of living overseas as a lens of looking at the world of today. In Season 2, Cities and Historical Sites, I've chosen 10 places from around the world that I've visited, which left an impression on me. And I'll talk about my experiences, what I learned, and how they made me think of the issues of today a little bit differently. Season 2, Episode 1, Tbilisi, Part 1. Tbilisi, Georgia. No, not that Georgia. Not the southern U.S. state of Georgia. The other one. The country. I posted some photos on one of my trips to Tbilisi a while back on social media, and a friend saw them and said, I had been to Georgia, but the photos you posted didn't look anything like what I saw. And then I remembered there was a country called Georgia somewhere. Yes, that's the one I'm talking about. The ancient one the one with castles and fortresses tucked between the Black Sea and Azerbaijan, with the majestic Caucasus Mountains providing a natural barrier to the north between itself and Russia. I've been fortunate enough to visit Tbilisi four times, and it has become one of my favorite cities in the world, at least so far. The first time Tbilisi ever came across my radar was during my second master's degree. I was taking a course simply entitled Stalin, and I found out that he, in fact, is a native Georgian, not Russian. And he spent time as a young activist in Tbilisi. More on that later. But I want to get back to the naked men I referred to earlier. Tbilisi in Georgian means warm place. One of the ancient rulers found naturally hot, healing mineral waters bubbling up from the ground in what is now known modern Tbilisi, and decided that this would be an excellent place to build a settlement. It has created a public bathhouse culture in Tbilisi, which is as traditional and consequential as the karcho beef stew, or their kachapuri with cheese and egg, or their vintage wine. In fact, wine is a Georgian word, and they are proud to proclaim themselves the birthplace of wine. More on that later. But let's talk bathhouses. The old town of Tbilisi is one of the most charming places you'll ever visit. The old fortress stands a centurion on the hill, overlording the city. Quaint old churches stand on the cliffs over the river. Houses and shops dot the slope with inviting balconies and amazing feats of architecture, which allow the buildings to hang where no building should. You can stroll along the streets and try the grape wine ice cream or sample the freshly pressed pomegranate juices or buy a container of fresh plumped red strawberries, or sit at a cafe and gaze at the lazy river with a semi-sweet wine lighting up your taste buds without hardly making a dent in your wallet. But of all the wondrous sights, sounds, and smells of Old Town, none stand out more than the bathhouses. There are a dozen or more places of business which offer both public and private bathhouse experiences. Some of them have brick-domed architecture which catch your eye and make you think you're on another planet. 
It all seems so strange and different, but it's a must try if you are in Tbilisi, so they say. I guess I had to. Since I was a novice in understanding Georgian bathhouse culture, I decided to take it easy with my first experience. I booked a room at one of the popular bathhouses. It has an ornate mosaic front, which reminds me at first of a mosque. But there are no daily prayers going on in there. It's an extensive place of small and large private rooms, some luxurious, others more modest. I picked a small room, being myself, and booked a towel package and a scrub down. I wanted the full experience. I walked in, there was a small bathroom on the left, straight away opened up into a small domed room with a large bathtub of steaming hot mineral water. To the left was a shower, to the right was a tile bed of some sort. I stripped down and quickly started soaking in the water. It was glorious, hot, steamy. They say the water here is used to treat many ailments, including conditions like eczema. Many have sworn by the healing properties of the Tbilisi water. Famous Russian poet Alexander Pushkin had his favorite bathhouse, which would undoubtedly soothe his soul and clear his mind to help him in his creative endeavors. I'm not sure what the water would do to my creative endeavors, but hot. It quickly became hot. Really hot. They warn you to drink water when in the bathhouse because the heat will draw the perspiration out of you and you can easily become dehydrated. I got out of the water and drank the only bottle of water I had, but I was still so hot. So I wrapped a towel around me and went into the hallway just so I could breathe a little easier. They told me to do that upon check-in. Go into the hallway if you get too hot. I did. Me in the hallway with only a towel around me, uh, I took a selfie. Why not? Must document. After a few minutes of cool down, I went back into the room and got in the water once more. That's when a middle-aged Georgian woman, who looked like she could have been a linebacker in the NFL, entered, and she yelled something to me in Georgian. I couldn't understand her. She said something again and again, and I nodded and stayed submerged in the bath. Then she left. A few minutes later, this even larger man entered. He was wearing only a towel wrapped around him. He motioned for me to get out of the bath and lie down on the tiled bed. I did. The scrub down. He had a bucket of sudsy water and a brush, and he poured cold water on me. I remember pulsing upward, but not for long. He suds me up and started scrubbing everywhere. No place untouched. He worked my entire body, even to the point that there were so many suds on my face that I couldn't even breathe. I gasped for air, and he seemed to ask if I was all right. I was. He rubbed and rubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed until I had never been this clean in my life. He told me to go to the shower and clean off. Then he left. I exhaled. Okay. Experience number one in the books. A couple of days went by as I recovered from the experience, but the idea of a public bathhouse kept gnawing at me. The public baths are where the real locals go. The tourists book private rooms, but the real bathhouse culture is in the public realm where you can enter for no more than a dollar, while a private room will cost you $20 or more. So I decided I had to try. I went to public bath number five, one of the oldest ones in Tbilisi. The public baths are separated by male and female. I paid the money, got a locker, and had to figure out how to do this. What I noticed is that no one took a towel in. I would have to enter the dark door of the bathhouse in the natural. So here goes. I closed the locker and I stood there. Okay, several workers sat in the corner. They had their clothes on. Okay, walk through the door. I walked through the door, and there were two lines of open showers. A couple of men were washing themselves. I walked past the showers to the pool. It was much smaller than I had anticipated, and there was no one in the pool. I jumped in, eager to hide under the surface. I had a perfect view of another man in the shower. A third man walked up to the pool and then sprawled out on the left, lying flat on the tiled area while a masseuse came in to scrub him down. It was dimly lit, hot, steamy. I felt like I was in a Russian mobster film. This would have been a great place for Lars or Ivan to come in with a pipe and break someone's kneecap for not repaying a loan on time. 
at least the kneecap could be soaked in the healing water right away to minimize the damage. The public bathhouse was a place of routine where grown men would meet weekly to chat with a friend, away from the women, hidden deep within the bowels of a bathhouse, and almost anything could go on and I dared not look in the darkened corners because I might find anything, indeed. I didn't last long in the public bathhouse. I went to the locker, dried off, got dressed, and left in record time. I felt out of place. I looked out of place. But I had done what I set out to do, to experience the real local culture of Tbilisi. Tbilisi has a friendly but gruff feel to it. There's a rowdiness in the air. It seems like there's always some sort of protest going on every other day. But people are friendly, especially if they speak some English. They don't get many American tourists there, and they're always happy to have some. It's probably because Americans go to the wrong Georgia, but oh well. Culture steeped in tradition. The beautiful Tbilisi Opera House. Continuous shows for over 170 years. I was privileged to watch a fantastic rendition of Nabucco, the famed opera by the master of Verdi. Georgia is steeped in the tradition of Georgian Orthodox Christianity. Brought by St. Nemo in 319 AD, making it the second country to adopt Christianity after Armenia, 12 years before Constantine did so for the Roman Empire. I visited St. Nino's remains at the Bodbe Monastery in the wine country of Katkedi. I went to Uplitstink. I'm pretty sure I didn't pronounce that right, but it's outside of the town of Gori, where Christians carved homes out of the stone in an attempt to live freely as they wished during a time of persecution. Georgians honor the traditions. They see value in preserving their way of life. Common faith. Everyone who drives by a church will cross themselves out of reverence. Rugged people from the mountains carving out farmlands along the riverbanks and mountain passes. Working the land, creating a vibrant and rich culinary experience, which they love to share over copious glasses of wine. It's a unique, robust culture, which I've enjoyed getting to know in my own small way. Seeing their culture made me think, about my own. What about America? America has often been described as a melting pot culture, a unique blend of people from many different places, which have blended together to create something truly unique. E pluribus unum. Look at your coins. From many. One. Is it still true? What common traditions do the vast majority of Americans still have? Are there still common threads that everyone or most everyone can agree on? Or have we become so fragmented into our blue states and red states, into our privileged classes and the shared oppression groups that we have forgotten the common ties that brought us all together? What about patriotism? A recent Wall Street Journal poll uh, states that 38% of Americans surveyed think patriotism is very important to them. In 1998, that figure was 70%. That's quite staggering. 32% drop in 25 years. Some people now consider patriotism to be, uh, what, what, what's the word, toxic? That someone who is patriotic is showing off their, their what, privilege? That patriotism equals what? Condoning the oppressive nature of neocolonialism? Are you still proud to be an American, as the song states? A recent article talked about some who condemned the displaying of the American flag as a symbol of oppression. Honestly, it's all kind of bizarre to me, from someone who's spent so much time overseas. The melting pot of America has homogenized so many different foods into the shared American experience. You know, I didn't grow up eating pizza or tacos. We lived in the countryside. There were no Italians around us. Mexicans? Well, I had heard of Mexico. I ate meat and potatoes and casseroles. Pork and sauerkraut on New Year's Day was the, tra was the tradition. Actually, I still remember the very first taco I ever ate. 
It was circa 1981. I was 13 years old. And a youth group leader from church had invited some kids over for dinner. They served hard corn shell tacos. It was like an epiphany for me. I remember going home all excited and I told my mom about this wondrous food called tacos and how we had to try it. I think my mom eventually found one of those prepackaged taco meals at the grocery store and that joined our regular rotation of meals. Now you can look and see how common it is to eat Chinese or Thai or sushi. That's the melting pot at work. We hear a lot about immigration these days and changing demographics. Many often cite the fact that by 2040, America will no longer be a white majority country and how that will change things once the collective minority groups are in the majority. Will that be the end of the melting pot? The end of e pluribus unum? Will the melting pot be poured out on indigenous land? Well, I came across an interesting article from Scott Rasmussen from Real Clear Politics. He states in the article that the 2040 minority figure ignores what has been going on. Many children are now the result of one white parent and one parent of color. But his point is that the majority of these are in what we would call white culture. They work and live the way that the majority of whites live in America. Here, here's his quote. Quote, so when we look back from the year 2021, we tend to visualize a more homogenous population that actually existed. Now, here's a comment. His point is that in the early 20th century, looking backward, we see white people. But it wasn't that way. It was Italians and Irish and Scandinavians. This was not a homogenous population by any means. There were signs that read Irish need not apply, etc., so that's what he's referring to when we look back. Continue. Quote, When we look forward, we see a more rigidly defined racial divide than actually exists. End quote. Uh, here's another comment. His point is that the culture is still more homogenized than you think, regardless of what color of skin the majority will be. He continues. Quote, In both cases, what we miss is the story of America. The real story of America is a nation with an expanding and ever more inclusive mainstream. That mainstream is guided by a shared desire to have the United States draw closer to living out its, its founding ideals of freedom, equality, and self-governance. End quote. And for me, that's the point. As the Georgians are proud of their wine, their food, their rugged history of surviving the Soviet era, their shared moral ideals driven by their devotion to the Georgian Orthodox Church, it would be a major step forward if America would once again recognize themselves as simply Americans. We are not groups of people or classes of people. We shouldn't be divided by levels of oppression or by historical grievances. We should be bound today by some of the characteristics which allowed our nation to thrive, hard work and innovation, freedom and independence, and individualistic pursuits intricately intertwined in the lives of our neighbors and fellow countrymen. If we can reclaim some of that, there is no reason we can't see a new, vibrant America stronger than ever in the latter half of the 21st century. This is Mark Sassy with the Crossing Ideas podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm not quite done talking about Tbilisi, Georgia yet. Episode two will be part two of Tbilisi, which I have entitled Stalin's Printing Press and Putin's Face. I'll recall my visit to Stalin's hometown and the amazing setting of Stalin's underground printing press. In doing so, I'll be able to share some perspectives of the war in Ukraine as well. That's next on the Crossing Ideas podcast. Remember to follow, share, comment on your preferred podcast service. Also, if you'd like to contribute to help support the podcast, it is very much appreciated. Don't forget to check out my books at www.mwsasse.com. And finally, thanks for listening.